Sid for being with us and uh, certainly your uh, your life is very inspiring you are really the the archetypal entrepreneur and your passion showed even during our initial uh, meetings and so the floor is yours i'm stopping to share well i'm going to start my um, my story about desalination uh, first with a personal story um, and I'm going to ask you, have you ever been to the country of Madagascar? Um, no. I don't, probably I don't see many hands. No. Uh, have you no. ever seen the animated movie Madagascar? Yes. Exactly. Yes. It's, it's Love a very, it. very well-known movie, but unfortunately, um, this, this uh, video doesn't really resell the truth. Madagascar is actually one of the 10 uh, least developed countries in the world. And I went there a long time ago. It was almost 10 years ago. Uh, on a surf trip alone uh, to the capital of Antananarivo and I went to the coastal Tuliar on the southwest coast and on my way there uh, I came across the boys that you see on this on this picture and I asked the driver to stop and uh, I talked to them and they explained to me that with these self-crafted vehicles uh, they spent every day two to three hours to collect water for their families and for their households and I tested and I tasted this water and I, I couldn't help but notice that this water was actually salt brackish water it was unfit for for consumption um but for these and these boys this source of water was the only way to live their lives it meant they couldn't go to school it meant their life expectancy is below 45 and this really this experience really had a big impact on me and a couple of hours later after saying goodbye to these boys i found myself in this abundant sea under this abundant sun and that's when i realized that these natural resources should become part of the solution for water scarcity. And that has fueled me with the inspiration to, to specialize as engineer uh, in water treatment and sustainable energy technology. And eight years ago, uh, start the organization Elemental Watermakers. And I'm one of the founders and the current managing director of Elemental Watermakers. And what we do with our organization is, is we turn seawater into drinking water, so desalination but then powered by renewable energies, such as the sun. And I'm gonna tell you everything about it later, but first I wanna zoom in for at, at the problem that we're looking at, water scarcity. And we just saw a, a map, um, but it's always tricky to look at a country level. So you should really look at a, a smaller level. And as you can see, um, there's already 4 billion people that are currently facing water scarcity. And of course, there's many sustainable development goals, but what frightens me when it comes to water scarcity is that the nature of this problem is actually increasing. So every year there's more regions facing water scarcity. And of course, many of these countries have already been identified, but it's getting more and more. Well, why is it getting more and more? To understand, to, to solve the problem, we really need to understand it. Of course, we're with more people, um, but mostly it's that the people have an increased water footprint. When we talk about water, it's often about the water we drink. But actually, when we drink a coffee, we need 150 liters of water to grow those coffee beans. So if I, here in the Netherlands, drink a cup of coffee from beans that come from Chennai in India, I actually contribute by drinking that coffee to water stress in Chennai. And this is a way of looking. It's called the water footprint that is not yet really mainstream but will become very important in the coming decades. Because we only drink two liters of water per day. In our households, we use maybe 100 liters of water per day. But then when you look at the true water footprint, it's more than thousands of liters of water per day. And of course, more people have a, uh, more welfare. So they also use more food, more consumption, more products, and more energy. And last but not least, we have climate change. And climate change prolongs droughts, so less water. Uh, for a longer time but also when it rains it rains really hard floods as you, we can see today on world water day in australia um, and this leaves the earth unable to collect the water so all this precious resource then goes through the rivers back to the ocean so water to many people uh, these days when it comes uh, when the summer times comes again it's not a question anymore if there's going to be a drought it's going to be the question Who's next? And this is in Europe, this is in Africa, this is in Asia, this is in Americas. This is a truly global problem. But fortunately, 
there's not only bad news, there's also a lot of good news. When we look at the water resources available, we can see that 70% of our world is covered by water. And from all this water, 97% is salt seawater. So we only have 3% of fresh water. So looking at these numbers as an engineer, the key to more water lies in the sea. Of course, when you, use, when you have freshwater resources, it will be more economic to treat the freshwater resources first. It's about recycling water, so wastewater treatment. It's about using water very efficiently. But at the end of the day, we also need to augment our water resources. And that is where desalination also comes in. So it's not the overall solution, but especially on regions that now lack water, it, it will be the solution to augment the natural water supplies. But when we talk about desalination, and it has been said before, um, it's, it's an energy intensive process. So when energy becomes expensive, the water automatically becomes expensive as well. Also, this energy often comes from fossil resources, which means that by making water, we're actually uh, emitting a lot of CO2. And this CO2 contributes to climate change, which leads to more droughts. droughts. So we find ourselves in a vicious circle. And last but not least, it's also a technology that's considered as high-tech, complex, uh, not easy to maintain, only possible in really large factories, in, 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 for example, in Dubai and Israel. And these are actually the three challenges that we set ourselves to overcome. So we ask ourselves, how can we get fresh water today without limiting tomorrow? And the way we do this is by using reverse osmosis. Reverse osmosis is the mainstream desalination technology. 70% of all desalination plants that are built today are by reverse osmosis. Um, and by using this technology, we need a lot of energy. So you can see that normally we have a high pressure pumps that pushes the seawater through a membrane and then 10 kilowatt hours are required for this pressure per cubic meter for per thousand liters of drinking water. But what we did is we implemented the concept of energy recovery and energy recovery is you reusing the saltier brine flow. So there's seawater going into the membrane, there's fresh water going, coming out, but there's also the saltier water, the brine, the concentrate flow, and this still contains all the pressure. We reuse the pressure to reduce the amount of energy required. And by doing so, we can use 70% less energy for the same desalination process. And this, it's already done at all the large scale factories but we made this technology available for systems below 500,000 liters per day for a community, for resorts, for a municipality, for an island. And this has made the desalination much affordable. So now let me just show you a little video that uh, explains this process a little bit better than perhaps I do. Let's take a look. All the required energy comes from the sun. The amount of energy we need is reduced by 75% using energy recovery technology. This technology uses the residual energy of the saltier water leaving the reverse osmosis membranes. This means we can do with four times less solar panels. Okay, so it's existing technology made suitable for smaller scale plants. Um, and of such, we need much less solar panels, we need much less energy, and this brings the cost of the desalinated water down. So because of this innovation, uh, it is possible to save 70% on the water expenses if you compare it with trucking water. It has become sustainable by the use of solar energy, off-grid, independent. And of course, by using existing desalination technology, we can ensure reliability, which is crucial for any industry, for any resort, for any community. Um, but also what is very important because many of the projects we do are remote. And when I talk about remote, it means 20 hours to the nearest city. It has to be easy to maintain. Uh, so people with, let's say, a lower education should be able to maintain it themselves through automation, uh, through remote monitoring, but also by using durable components. So not low grade steels, uh, not inexpensive valves, but really high grade materials to make sure that even in 10 years from now, these systems keep on running. And I'm going to dive a little bit deeper into these desalination technologies that are available uh, so you get a better understanding of the possibilities of desalination. What we offer, we offer three different ways uh, to turn seawater into, into drinking water. 
all based on the same desalination process. Uh, it is important to understand that desalination, of course, only is a viable solution at coastal regions because you need a constant access to salt water. When you're talking about inland desalination, brackish water desalination, in my opinion, it's not a long-term solution because you're over extracting the aquifer and you're just displacing the problem and you have to deal with your brine, which is a saltier uh, disposal, which you cannot dispose of. In the sea, you can return the slightly saltier seawater easily and you can also know that in 10 years from now, the sea will be still available for desalination. So when we look at the first option here, it's just the water treatment part. If you already have a electricity available, for example, if you're not off grid, um, on the picture, you see a desalination device. You can see the membranes, you can see the high pressure pumps and the integrated energy recovery. It's APP, APM, actual piston pump, actual piston motor. Might get too technical, but that uh, reduces the amount of that energy with 70%. And this one, this can make 10,000 liters of drinking water on a daily basis. And the energy consumption of this one is 2.7 kilowatt hour per cubic meter. So if you look at the economics compared to uh, standard reverse osmosis, and this is just for, it's very case specific. So a system of 10, 100 or 500 cubic meters per day have a very different price point. But also, it depends really on the location, if the transportation is expensive for the installation and the commissioning. So this is an example, uh, but it gives you a better insight. You can see on the light blue line, you see an efficient desalination system. And on the darker blue line, you see the expenses over time of a traditional desalination system. You can see the investment is a little bit higher because of the energy recovery. But within a year, the payback is already realized. Uh, and at the end of the day, after nine years, you're already over 50% savings. So at this small capacity, it is possible on the right side, you see the, the water cost. You can see that it's possible to generate water for less than $2 for 1,000 liters of drinking water. And you should compare that with the price you now pay for example, a small bottle or half a liter of drinking water. And that's why the economics do, um, they do make out. You see, for example, a system in, in Belize. Uh, this is a, one of the world's most private islands. You have to take a helicopter there to get there, uh, but then you can enjoy one of these systems in operation. And it makes nine cubic meters per day. So this is just one of the examples um, for places with already energy. If we're now talking to places without any energy, we can provide an off-grid system. And this is the elemental water source. So it can be deployed at any coastal location that doesn't have any energy and doesn't have any water supply. Uh, it all fits in this small container. So the blue container has all the water treatment equipment inside and the solar panels which come on top all fit in the container. So it's almost like an IKEA version. It's like a plug and play system to desalinate drinking water. It can be set up in half a day because the solar panels, the water tank, the piping, it all comes inside the container and it just can be installed on top of the roof or next to it in a matter of hours. And that's what makes it so suitable for both community water supply, uh, for private properties and industries, but also for emergency response, uh, for uh, refugee camps, for temporary applications, for disaster relief. And you can see here, a look inside the container. Of course, you have on the one side the water treatment equipment. We take the seawater, we take out the large particles by pretreatment, and we desalinate the water, having only very pure water. We remineralize the water to drinking water because we take out so many particles that it's almost a bit um, empty. So we remineralize the water to increase its taste, and then we store it. And before it gets used, it gets treated one more time by UV and activated carbon to. Uh, avoid any contamination that might have occurred during storage. So it's really a World Health Organization standards of drinking water. And this whole process, it's powered by the solar panels that are on top. Um, energy is stored in a small battery bank to overcome uh, passing clouds or fluctuations. And this energy is used to set up the whole system. But also when it's in standby, it automatically flushes the membranes and it keeps its, itself alive so that the membranes only have to re be replaced after five to seven years. This container can make water, but it can also provide additional power, for example, for charging phones or, or lights when a, for reading or computers or laptops, Wi-Fi. There can be a smart water tap for, for payment included. And of course, extra water storage uh, to help in the distribution. 
And these kind of units can come in different sizes. So you can do it really small, 5,000 liters per day, but you can also scale it up to 40,000 liters per day and larger, of course. And the energy consumption stays around the 2.7 kilowatt hour per cubic meter. When we look at uh, the economics of this system, so if we, for example, compare a community that are now forced to uh, transport water with a truck, and then they often pay five, six dollars per cubic meter, such off-grid system can also in the order of two dollars per cubic meter per day for the smaller system. And this really goes down to one dollar per cubic meter per day for the larger scale systems. And this is really the price point where also the huge desalination facilities in Dubai and Israel are at. So that has made it possible to have the same kind of price for the water, uh, but really on a decentralized small scale off grid application. And that's that's really exciting. Uh, here, you, for example, see a, a system in the Philippines. Uh, this is a water kiosk. So there's seven people working there, selling and distributing and maintaining the system. And of course, this also not only increases the health, but also economic development and, and jobs. So this, this model, the water kiosk model, uh, it's a very interesting model, for example, for NGOs and for investors who are looking to make impact. Because by providing a loan for a, a person to operate such a water kiosk, they can have uh, not only clean water, but also job generation, security, increased health, uh, education. Uh, and of course, there's a financial side to it as well, because there's, there's a huge return on investment. But we think this model can also be very interesting for, uh, yeah, for remote communities and for impact investors. And of course, afterwards, I'll be available to answer any questions on, on anything that I showed. The last system that we have, it uses not batteries, but gravity. So then the battery is replaced by a potential energy buffer. So by using the, let's say the potential energy from gravity, we can use solar energy to pump seawater up during the day. And this provides the pressure required for the desalination process. So with solar energy, with this system, we can make water 24 seven. And then we don't need any batteries, but we do need a lot of elevation. So what we did is we um, made another energy recovery device and that has 80% less elevation required. So if there's any system close to a hill of 90 meters, we can also do this totally off grid and no energy losses. Um, but we need to sort of start winding up. Uh, okay. Sid. I'll, but... I'll, yeah, I'll keep continuing. So this is, in, for example, the BVI, uh, Systems have, have overcome hurricanes, and these are economically very interesting. Just to give you a glimpse, these are uh, the countries where we have projects. So they are very comparable to the map where there's problems, but even at small scales, at islands, at coastal regions, even at a country that has a lot of water, you can see these kind of systems uh, increasing in demands. This is for private properties, for communities, for resorts. Um, and this is, this is quite interesting actually, but we, we reduce the amount of salt in the brine. We don't use any chemicals and we make sure it's easy to operate. So this is this makes it very uh, unique, this solution. And we're, when we say waterfall, we really mean waterfall. Uh, I think to conclude, it's, it's important to see we do a lot of projects for resorts and properties, but also for communities. I actually set up a foundation for the people in Madagascar that I met. It's called the Elemental Water Foundation. Um, and two years ago, uh, we got invited by the we were talking about Dubai, this Mohammed bin Rashid. He gave us the first prize out of 139 organizations. That was, of course, great. But what is mostly important is I was able to finance a system for the people in Madagascar through our foundation. And this is a picture two years ago where we opened the system for them. And actually, this year, we, we're building the second project. And next year, the third. So, um, yeah, that's, of course, great. COVID is, is restricting us. But this is why we made this um, Elemental water source, this containerized solution. I did bring a video, but I'm not going to show it because of time constraints. So what I want to do is I want to thank you for listening in. And uh, please let me know if you have any questions. And I hope you have a wonderful World Water Day. Thank you, Sid, for this wonderful presentation. Uh, we have got two questions from the audience but if i may i'm just wanting to use my power to as a uh, as a moderator to ask you one two questions that have come from other experiences first of all uh, a citizen's question what is the what is the smallest size that you can make that is what is the minimum size of the community required to have your kiosk system 
in terms Swap, of population? Yeah, no, the smallest system that we can provide uh, makes around 3,000 liters per day. So when you look uh, at the size of the community and you target only drinking water, we would assume two liters per person per day. Mm. So this is, means a community of around 1,500 people. Okay, so it can be very small. The, the second thing I want to ask is that in uh, many places where we have tried out actually like solar in the, the past 20 years, even these high-tech Bill Gates toilets and all, uh, basically there is vandalism. That is, it's so cute that people one night you will find uh, that all the parts are missing. You see, this is a very common problem. I was wondering how they dealt with it in Madagascar or is it that they haven't had any problems of vandalism? Not in the resorts, but in the uh, when you put it in uh, challenged communities. No, I, I understand your question. I think this is something we always ask. So when we do a community project, the security, of course, is very important. And what we do is we try to create a license to operate. So by working together with a local NGO that has been well established in the region for, let's say, 20 years, and by um, by hiring the people from the community to operate the system, distributing the system, the community starts to understand the value that the system creates to their community. And when that is realized, then they also understand it should be protected and they will not think about stealing these panels. So, so far we've been successful. We have had not had any uh, theft event and there's more than 15 systems for communities, but it is of course something we have to uh, work on with the local partner in the future. Very interesting. I will read out the first question. Can you say something about the carbon, uh, carbon respective water footprint of the manufacturing and use of the water kiosk itself? And is that is it relevant to look at the kiosk also as uh, something that uh, puts a carbon imprint in the local community? This is from Keys PUM. No, I think it's a very interesting point. What we've done now so far is we've um, looked at the carbon reducing CO2 reduction uh, from either transporting water or using uh, fossil driven inefficient desalination technology we can quantify the reduction but of course to set a uh, to create a, a water kiosk there uh, also has a carbon footprint we try to minimize it by using uh, material that can be recycled and reused and of course by uh, using high grade materials but it would be interesting to to, to do a, a life cycle analysis of the let's say the whole uh, water kiosk to quantify that so if there's anybody in the audience that would be interested in doing so please contact me um, very good then Anushri asked another question. In uh, many countries, uh, in urban areas, uh, their uh, houses already have solar panels installed. Okay, so she was she. I think Anushri, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, is it can we just add a desalination desalination part to the existing system so that? Uh, yeah, can... you're correct. Like if you could uh, like connect the machinery of the desalin, uh, which uses uh, desalination techniques to the already installed solar panels and we can create the drinking water from the salinized water in the houses itself so that they don't use the natural resources which are the important, like which are the important uh, derivatives for the rural areas, like to combat that. Yeah, no, thanks a lot. I, I think it's very clear, your question. Uh, and it's very relevant as well, uh, because we see, of course, solarization much more and more. Uh, when there is a solar energy system in place, it is possible. When there's okay. solar energy alone, it's not possible. And the difference is really with, um, so for example, when there's a house that has solar panels and a battery, and then the battery is connected to maybe the ref refrigerator and the TV mm -hmm. and the desalination unit, that's possible because then the, ba the battery uh, overcomes the storage and provides the required energy output. When the battery is taken away, so we're just talking about solar panels, uh, we cannot connect the desalination system simply because the fluctuations and also the DC-AC uh, okay. problem. Yeah. Uh, so we so need can we create a low voltage uh, desalination machine in the households, which can derive their, which are capable enough to derive the limited power, even if it is for a few amount of hours, from those solar, solar panels. 
we have emergency response units that work on 12 volt, um, which come in a suitcase. So it's a portable unit, basically. It makes 30 liters per hour, but they are not used for um, permanent application. And the okay. thing here is that because you need so much energy, uh, mm. the DC uh, cannot create the high pressures for the, okay. so you need AC pumps. And All that's right. why the 12 volt becomes, for permanent applications, it becomes difficult. So one silly question after this. Uh, okay. Can, Sorry, can I ask the last one? Okay, Just because we need to move last. to the next speaker. There are two yeah. more questions here. All right. Do you Ocean, permit me? Uh, take much time. So, I, I uh, want to answer, ask the other two questions, Anushree, okay, if you permit. Right. But yeah, you can always sure. send it in a private chat to Sid just now. All right, okay, all but right. after this question, this is the last Fine. question, Sid. Fine. They are just asking, you see, is it, uh, as I understand it, finally, uh, what you, what people want is safe water. So is it going to just take out the salt or can it also remove other impurities? And how long will it last these membranes? Good question. Uh, the, so when you look at the filtration spectrum, which is something you can look up online, filtration spectrum membrane, you will see that uh, salt particles are a thousand times smaller than viruses, which are a thousand times smaller than bacteria. So by taking out the salts, we take out the viruses, we take out the bacteria, we take out iron, manganese, arsenic. So everything is taken out by the reverse osmosis membrane. So the water is very pure. That's why we also remineralize it. Um, and what was the second question? How long do these membranes last? How oh, often do they have to be uh, changed? In, in, when the system is operated uh, properly, the membranes last five to seven years. Okay. Thank you very much for an excellent presentation, Sid. You're welcome. Uh -huh.